I know this is the last one and there's flights to catch and long drives to make, so. Well, I have seven questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, brother. I, I really appreciate this. This particular topic has been on my mind um, lately. And um, because I've been going through the book of Ephesians myself and through the last couple of chapters there, I, I'm sure if you had more time, you would have uh, turned to some of those passages as well. Um, I'm, I think when I say this, I'm not disagreeing with you. I think I'm agreeing with you, actually. Um, but to me, the key here in verse 7 of 1 Peter 3 um, is to treat her as, as the weaker vessel. Not necessarily that, this isn't a descriptor, and I think you, you presented this well. It's not describing her as a weaker vessel, but this is the type of treatment that she is to receive is as a weaker vessel, as someone who has submitted herself to her husband. I, I agree with you on that because Ephesians 5, uh, there in verse 28 and 29, it says, So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Uh, just as the Lord does the church. And again, these are things that are, are commands. This is part of what it means to love. Uh, I think you also mentioned that this is not uh, joint submission because the husband is given notice here that the wife is not given, that he's supposed to nourish and cherish her. A similar command, I forget which word it is, whether it's nourish or cherish, but it's found in chapter 6 and verse 4 for fathers to children. Now that doesn't mean that the wife is supposed to be treated like a child, but she is supposed to be taken care of, right? I, I wanted your thoughts on that. Well, actually, your comments are great. I, I would say that that fits in very well, uh, especially the Ephesians 5 one of caring for your body. It's, it's part of that recognition of somebody who chooses to submit to you. So as that authority, you, th that person is trusting you and putting their life kind of in your hands. And I would say that that aligns perfectly. So I, I, I don't really have much to add to that. That was amazing. I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Uh, one of my favorite studies is studying the house, how the household works, the husband-wife relationship. Oh, I just get so excited. You did a great job, um, especially the weaker vessel. I feel like sometimes I mention it, someone else mentions it. People get nervous about it. Um, well, so much fun. So I have at least five questions. I'll do it just two now. If there's time, I'll ask more later. Um, but my first question is, you mentioned, I hope I don't butcher the name, Strouch? I think it's Strock, but Strock. somebody can okay. correct me. Um, what, his book, what is the title of that and the name of others? Men, in, men and Women Equal Yet Different. Okay, men, um, so well, that's an easy one. I hope there's more of those. Um, <laughs> well, my second question is, in the excitement of getting a relationship, at the meetings, there's that buzz of boys and girls, ooh, am I going to meet the one? Um, how, what advice would you give to young people to help prepare them for success? That way they're not just in that buzz of emotions, but rather regarding God's word. Well, there's a bunch of people here that are probably more prepared for that than I. I have three teenagers right now, and uh, I admit that if I claimed I have a plan and I have it all figured out, then we can just have prayer right now, because that's that would be far from the case. But... Uh, something that I think most people here that have had some success, the emphasis is getting to know people from a, a spiritual perspective on goals in life. Uh, I think the statistics still hold out that one of the greatest forms of divorce when they go through all of these stats um, still maintains, even though financial things are, are in there, a difference in faith is one of the largest drivers of what splits a marriage. So to spend time during that dating phase to make sure that you understand the priorities and goals that people have spiritually. Uh, you can weather a lot of other storms if you're on the same page there. That would be m the best I could give you. George Batty. Sean, you did a good job. I, uh, Thank you. I appreciate it, especially as they said on the spur of the moment um, without a, a lot of advance notice. Uh, I would just like to offer a suggestion. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think the way you, you came across, to me anyway, is 
it, this is an either or proposition and I have to choose either physical strength or uh, she's weaker in the sense that she submits willingly to the okay. authority of her husband. And I would just like you, I would, I would suggest to you to make it a both and uh, type of approach. Uh, I think that physical weakness fits the context if you don't mind me asking, can I ask? Can I ask why? I, I appreciate well, you. Okay, so first of all, the, the word that's being translated "weak" is um, well. I need three hands here. Uh, you've got, you've got a third hand. Asthenes, if I'm saying that correctly. Mm -hmm. Anyway, <laughs> BDAG uh, has, and I realize that this is subjective of how they classify yep. the the definition and, and in this passage, 1 Peter 3, 7 is listed under physical weakness. And so that's probably one reason why a lot of commentaries uh, like Barnes and others, uh, but what I listened to that Barnes definition that, or comment that you gave, and I think he was including more than just physical weakness. Looked to me like he was including uh, weaknesses in in uh, emotional issues and other things as well. And I, I just think that maybe um, a both and approach would be a little better. Um, and and I'll consider that. I appreciate that. Especially in this day and time, you know, where you know we've gone through this uh, equal equal rights thing, where women women are just as good as men in every matter. And then when it comes time for the Olympics and for swim meets, you know, we got this crazy deal over there in Pennsylvania, you know, where the transgender male is competing in swim meets with, you know, on the girls team. And he's winning. He has time to get out of the water and go drink a cup of coffee before the other swimmers come in from, from their lap, you know. So... I think in this context, the husband is being warned, don't physically abuse your wife, don't mentally abuse her, don't abuse your position as uh, her, her head of authority. And I think all of that is included. And I think it fits the context. It's just telling husbands how to dwell with their wives uh, and don't abuse either your position of authority or her physically. That, that's just... No, I, I appreciate it. And from what I understand, that term weak is found in other passages that we know quite a bit. And I don't claim to be, I don't have English down well enough to, to say that I have, uh, you know, Greek down. But like, you know, when Paul says to the weak, I became weak, it's the same term. And so uh, I understand there's some things that could be looked at there. The only thing that I would maybe kind of cautious uh, caution us about is I understand what you're saying. And, and this would be my only kind of counter is that I understand we have a lot of things going on in the world trying to eliminate all differences. But that also be cautious that our desire to get physical things there isn't a reaction to that as well. Because I don't know that that's necessary to the context or to address those problems in society. We have plenty of other passages and situations. So that would be the only counter that I would kind of caution with on the other side of that. Because I would, I would agree with your conclusions. I don't where I'm, I'm still wrestling and clearly take a particular position, whether or not that's what fits here in verse seven. So I appreciate that very much so. Thank you. Good job, Sean. Thank you. Um, just a couple of things. I don't know if this, well, I was going to comment on something that Austin said about the word as here. Uh, and I don't know if this fits what George was suggesting or not, but I think it might. And that is, this is not saying uh, give honor to the wife as to the weaker vessel in the sense that she may or may not be. Because the next phrase says, as being heirs together. Uh, it's not expressing doubt that they're heirs together. They are heirs together. She is just as valuable spiritually as he is. And so I think this may uh, agree with what George has said. I'm not sure. But <clears throat> the wife is the weaker vessel. 
In whatever way she may be weaker, physical strength oftentimes, uh, maybe her constitution is weaker in a particular case. I mean, uh, whatever way she is weaker, she is certainly the weaker vessel in that she has chosen to submit her authority to you voluntarily and in these other ways as well. And so you better be treating her right. It's and one of the ones that I think maybe you guys have heard, too, where somebody says, you know, you treat it as something very precious, right? You're not throwing it around, trying to break it. And, and again, that I wouldn't disagree with that, that, uh, that analogy at all either. Yeah. Thank you, brother, for that excellent presentation. Uh, one comment. Usually when I'm reading a book, uh, a study, and the author says something like this verse was just added in there and doesn't have any merit, I usually throw the book away almost immediately. I rarely read any further than that. But um, I had a question re regarding 1 Timothy chapter 2. The Apostle Paul is talking about submission there in verse uh, 11. This is after the modesty uh, point. Mm -hmm. And he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over man, but to be in silence. He's describing the type of submission. And then he says, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. That would support your conclusion of the priority in, in birth or in generation. Mm -hmm. And then he says, and Adam was not deceived. It's like he's given two mm -hmm. uh, reasons yep. that in my mind, tell, uh, this is my question, if, if, let me know if I'm wrong. In my mind, demonstrates why she is the weaker vessel. Uh, yeah, and the question is, I'll give you my understanding of this, and this is, again, open for discussion and critique, but the first one is the, the order. The second one is, is because she attacked the structure that her actions attacked the marriage structure. She was to be this, the submissive wife in that relationship, and her behavior, she stepped out of that role, right, and tried to become the head. Um, and so that that particular element is still, I believe, found in that particular passage. Well, I think you did a really good job, Sean. I appreciate you tackling this topic because we do need to talk about it. Uh, and it's a tricky passage. Uh, when I think of it, you know, I can't help but wonder how much of how we approach this passage has been colored by the economic situation we've grown up in here in post-World War II America. And, you know, there's sort of the concept of the 1950s housewife who uh, she stays home all day because her husband's out working and she gets faint after vacuuming the house. And, you know, but any of us who have traveled abroad uh, to developing countries have seen the strength of women there in conjunction with men, because everybody's got to work <laughs> to survive in those situations. And I've seen plenty of women who could smoke me carrying water from the well uh, to, to get Especially the Especially the done. ones that balance it on their head. Yeah. That I, I do not have that ability. Yeah. So, I mean, I, but at the same time, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that generally most men uh, are taller, they outweigh, and they have more muscle mass than most women. That wasn't generally. a short joke, was it? No. Okay. <laughs> I was checking. Um, so, you know, but I, but I think there was a quote in there which I think summarized it really well and I think went with what Brother George was saying. I think it's some combination of, uh, of the physicality side and the emotional side, and, but just the fact that women are putting themselves in a vulnerable position to the man that they're married economically, um, maybe strength-wise, too, and, and submitting to them in that role that God has ordained. And so the way we are to treat them is to, to have a, the knowledge of that, the realization of that, and it should characterize our actions. So I just really liked that quote. I thought it summarized it well. On Second uh, Timothy, I mean First Timothy 2, uh, I think there's something here that is often overlooked that we need to observe. So he says, I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man but to be in silence. Verse 
12. But verse 13 says, For Gar, giving a reason, Adam was formed first, then Eve. So and I think that's simply order there, like you said. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman, that's Eve. That's not, that is not saying that all women are more gullible than men. And, uh, but Eve was deceived because she did what you said she did. She stepped into the leadership role by responding to the serpent. And Adam was with her, the text says. Then in verse, the woman being deceived fell into transgression. Nevertheless, she, that's still Eve now, it's singular. She shall be saved in childbearing. And this is where the concept of bringing the Messiah into the world. If they, that is her descendants, continue in faith, love, and holiness with self-control. But we need to keep in mind, this is not saying women are more gullible than men, necessarily. I will quote somebody else on this, that uh, for those that draw that conclusion, you know, then the other thing you probably have to draw that men are inherently irresponsible, right? Because you've got to acknowledge both sides of what happened there in Genesis chapter 3. So to make the sweeping statement that women are more gullible, well, then you have to admit that men are just generally more irresponsible as well. So uh, that sword kind of cuts both ways. I think that any topic about the home benefits everyone. And we all learn and we all need to learn at every stage of life. So Ephesians chapter 5 describes the ideal relationship comparing husband and wife to the relationship between Christ and the church. And that chapter concludes those ideal relationships described by saying that in our homes there must be love and respect. Now that's the ideal. What Peter addresses is that what is something is not ideal? So that's how chapter 3 begins. In a less than ideal relationship, how is a spouse to conduct themselves? And what we learn is that even when life is not ideal for us, we still have to occupy our role to the very best of our ability, even if our spouse chooses not to. And so to me, looking at, at verse 7, seems to say that, okay, Here's who wives need to be, but let's say they're not. Who is a husband going to be? Well, here's how he needs to dwell with his wife. And how important is this? It's so important that if he doesn't, his prayers are slowed down. And I've, comp I've, I've seen that compared to walking through 20 feet of snow. It's like, you want your prayers to have trouble getting to heaven? Just mistreat your wife. And the excuse of, well, she's this. No, no, no. You have to be who you need to be. And in working with couples through the years, there's always this issue of, well, if she'll do what she needs to do, then I'll do what I need to do and vice versa. And we always go to Ephesians chapter 5 to say, in the church Christ relationship, who went first? Well, it was Christ. So he went to the cross for all of us who put him there, he went first. And in the husband-wife relationship, who's to go first in making sure our home glorifies God? Well, it needs to be the man. So how do we do that? Well, we have to exemplify these behaviors, especially when we don't understand them. So the weaker vessel is one of those areas that yes, it can be both, because we have to say, we don't care what it is. That's still who we must be. And anytime we step outside of that, we are pushing our wife to lead our home. So if we don't consider our wife as if she is a weaker vessel, does that mean we're pushing her forward? Because that in essence by his silence is what Adam did with Eve. So our behavior is at stake, our prayers are at stake, and we have to be who we must be, even when our wife is not, just as she has to be who she needs to be, even when we are not. But when we both work at it 100%, ah, oh, what a beautiful picture that we can portray on earth of the relationship between Christ and the church.
Thank you. Amen. I, you, you mentioned one thing, too, that I, I find a little bit interesting is, you know, the Bible spends all of this time. You, you mentioned something about, you know, I'm going to go do my thing and go my way. And the other one says, I'm going to go my way and kind of do what I need to do or want to do. And I, if, if I understood you correctly by what you said. But ironically, we live in a culture where a husband and wife live under the same roof but live almost separate lives. Meanwhile, the entire picture of the Bible is trying to get them to function as one. And those two things have to get worked out to be able to create that beautiful picture that you provided. I can't live independent of my spouse having my own things. And the only time is we pass like ships in the night at, at the house and say, see you tomorrow at about the same time. There has to be a level of unity there if we're going to be able to, d to demonstrate that picture. Thank you. Appreciate it. Ron Porter. If my comment is like I haven't been here, that's because, frankly, I haven't heard all the discussion. But I wanted to make one little comment, and that is, you know, in critiquing this idea of the physical strength and trying to, what we want to remember, if that was overemphasized, what we want to still remember is, is this, this weaker vessel relationship relates to a spiritual concept. And it seems like the spiritual concept in general is not noticed enough in these verses. So while we might talk about, well, maybe we physically overemphasize the physical weakness part, don't let that be lost on what the spiritual emphasis of the weaker vessel is in that verse. And so kind of going back to George's thing about being able to balance that. Well, like I say, I was a deaf man throwing one in there, and I take my chances. <laughs> <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you, Ron. I was showing that was just great. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, what I'm about to say is the kind of thing if I were at home, I'd sit down with my word processor and I'd start writing it out. After I pecked out a couple of pages and edited it for a while, I'd probably just abandon the whole idea. <laughs> of that. But I thought, while well, we've got all these fellows here, I uh, might just throw it out here. And this is not necessarily to critique what George said, but uh, I, I just did a little search and uh, I wasn't aware of this. Uh, so. But I find that uh, that word for weak is the word that's also used by Paul in Romans Romans 5 and verse 6. Six which correct. Is translated here yes. for when we were still without strength. Correct. Or weak. And that seems to me to be a, a positional weakness. Yes. That uh, we're all in. It's not physical, per se. And then I got to thinking about that and thought, well, over in 1 Peter 3 and verse 7. He's using the comparative there. It's an adjective. Okay. And so he's using a comparative. And then I think, well, uh, if, the, if it's a comparative, then compared to what? And of course, I guess compared to the man. Now, I realize that he could be weaker physically, or she could be weaker physically compared to him. Oh, I don't know if I'm, if I'm going down a tunnel here or not. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to think through uh, just the implications of what he means the weaker vessel and now that I'm standing here saying it it doesn't seem quite as uh, quite as compelling as it did when I was thinking about it but maybe maybe you can well I'm, you can I'm hoping because my knowledge of Greek is not there going down the road and looking at a bunch of the different usages I struggled with Romans 5 was one of them that I came across the the first Corinthians chapter 9 and some others um, there's there's clearly a variety of usages and some of those different forms and stuff, I, I would, whatever you put on that word processor, if you don't mind emailing it to me, I would like to read it. I appreciate your uh, talk, and it does lend a better balance to the uh, topic here. I tend to agree with George that I, I think it's kind of a, uh, a, it's not an either or uh, on this. One of the things that I have found helpful through the years in teaching on this passage seems to keep cutting out when I teach on this. Passage it's not me <laughs> about uh, Abraham and, and uh, Sarah calling him Lord. You know, that that can be very offensive, you know, from a woman's standpoint there. 
but explaining the weakness, weakness doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. You know, being weaker can be an asset. You know, we think about a, a, a fuse, you know, in an electrical system, it's a weak link, but it's there for a reason and it, it's necessary to protect things. Uh, so weakness, you know, we can try and explain that as a positive uh, rather than it just being viewed as the negative one's better than the other. And to demonstrate that with the, with the example given there of Abraham, it says Abraham, or Sarah called Abraham Lord. But I also always go back and bring out the example of Sarah also went to Abraham and petitioned him with her thoughts about Hagar and Ishmael. And she said, send this woman away. She is not good for our family. And Abraham listened to Sarah. And so I think if we look at the whole context and the thing, the example being talked about Abraham and Sarah more than just her calling him Lord, we see that he was demonstrating and he valued her as that, that weaker link. So we might uh, present the idea of maybe that emotional thing that we call an emotional weakness, not a weakness, but more of an emotional sensitivity and awareness of situations that a lot of times me, you know, we as men are not attuned into the emotional you know, ramification of perceptions of people. And we need our, our wives and women to make us aware of those things to avoid more difficulty, more conflict in those things. So thinking of weakness uh, more as kind of the canary in the coal, coal mine sometimes might be a, a better way to think about that. Yeah, I appreciate that. I would, I would have two questions kind of back to you. One would be, if it is that canary illustration, why would we need to call it a weakness, right? To me, that would be a strength rather than a, than a weakness. Um, and that, so that would be my one question back to you. Well, in response to that, I don't think it says weakness there. I, I think it's the weaker vessel. And so something being weaker does not necessarily mean that it is a, yeah. a weakness in character, but it's just a, a description. It, it could be a quality that something is weaker. Okay. And then the second one that I was going to ask you too is the usage of that term where the weaker is a, this is what I was looking for as well. In scripture, that same term being used in a comparison where it's a positive. Um, I haven't come across it yet, but to claim that I've got an e expansive study on it, I would be, again, we could have prayer here in a minute. So that's why I was curious if in your study with that, did you come across a usage in that way? Not particularly. I, okay. I just feel like it's it's very narrow narrow viewed to just say it does not that we don't even consider that the the physicality of the situation with a woman being weaker. I I, I think that's just kind of a and, given there. And yeah, and I, I appreciate I have a hard time just yeah. totally uh, dismissing that aspect of them and saying it's all about hatred. But I do believe it goes back to Ephesians and the idea of headship. I think that's the primary yeah. thing. And if we focus on that, I, I, don't, I think the other is much more palatable and makes sense. Uh, and then if we put it uh, contextually with you know, Abraham and Sarah and other examples of, well, how, how did she call him Lord? How did she demonstrate that? And how did he treat her as a, a weaker vessel you know, in regards to that? And, you know, so. and I appreciate several with the critique and I'll, I'll take that right now. That's not where I'm at, but I appreciate everybody's willingness to do this. There was uh, something in my notes that I didn't get to because I talked too long anyway, but um, you know, one of the things that did jump out at me, as you look at all the different illustrations of the, uh, of the different roles and what's being discussed, physical strength and is not found in any of them. Right? The government won. There's no focus on physical strength in the master slaves. There's no focus on physical strength. And really, the wife won in verses 1 through 6. That's not, a, that's not an emphasis on physical strength. That's, a, that's an emphasis on a, 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 an unfortunate position that she's in. And so when we jump to that last one, I, I'm not denying that, generally speaking, again, that fact is true, but I'm not sure why we have to hold on to it because I don't know what it adds yet. 
To me, if the emphasis in the, and the focus when we do all of this is reminding us of our role within the home, physical strength really doesn't add much value to it. It would be, would be my counter to you right now. Well, I'm not saying, I, because there's a bunch of people here that I respect wholeheartedly, yourself included, that are saying, hey, maybe we need to balance this. So I will be looking at it. I'm just giving you my thought process. Well, part, part of our, our role in headships is the fact that God has innately created us very differently with, with the ability to do different things. So, uh, you know, being physically, you know, smaller in stature and, and, and possibly more frail in, in frame or health or something, you know, I don't think that's really the point as a weakness, but I think that we can accept that God made women differently because they are designed to fulfill a different role. And I would argue that it's a compliment, right? So Correct. it's the other half of the whole. Correct. Appreciate you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Just to kind of validate some of the things that my brother just said, uh, in 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul says, to the weak I became as weak, those were the weaker conscience brethren, I think, that he brings up in chapter 8. And in chapter 10, they actually end up being the ones that are in the Strong. right. Yeah. Because the stronger conscience ones there are the ones that were going into the idol's temple, and he tells them this is idolatry. And so I don't think that weakness has to mean inferiority or, or, or right or wrong in that situation, but it, it was just a quality rather than a flaw. And now, the only thing, and, and this is just me, so I'm throwing this out here. In the 1 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9 illustration, though, he's taking on that perception that they are the weak, right? He's basically, it's that, what is it, ad hominem, and it, that he's saying, if I take the position that you're taking, you're still not right. But then he goes on in chapter 10 and says, you're not right. So I've struggled with that weakness being a positive if he's taking their position to show them the error of their position. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? I understand what you're saying. I'm not sure... I would necessarily agree because okay. the idea of a weak conscience does not mean that it's a lesser conscience. It means that it's more easily defiled, it's more frail. That's very similar to what Brother David was just saying. And he never really presents that as a bad thing. That, that can be a very good thing to have a conscience that is more apt to, to, to find something to, to have a flaw in it, perhaps. And so uh, I'm not sure that I would necessarily agree, but I understand where you're coming from. And one more point about uh, differences in strength not necessarily being a difference in value. We would all acknowledge angels are much stronger than us. And they certainly serve a very different role than us. And yet, as Glenn talked about earlier in the study, God doesn't give aid to the angels like he gives to us. We have a, our own unique and special role within his plan. I don't think he values us less than he values the angelic beings uh, of the invisible realm, like Glenn talked about. So that was just kind of a, a side point from something that was said earlier. I'll think about that. I appreciate it. We really are out of time, but would you like to make your closing? No, I, thank you, and I appreciate uh, the feedback and the critique as well. That's that's very helpful, um, and so I appreciate the spirit in which all of that was done. So thank you very much.